All right, so uh, just so you know, if, if you wanted to download a copy of the paper, you can get it from my website, cthon.tech slash papers. Uh, this one is old. It's from 2016. It first showed up on Norman Geisler's website. Uh, it also showed up in the Journal of the ISCA, uh, International Society of Christian Apologetics, back in 2017. So an oldie but a goodie, hopefully. <clears throat> All right, so Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto say a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. All the powers of old Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exercise this specter. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. And there's a few James Bond movies where they make the bad guys uh, into specter. That's the name of their... Uh, conspiracy theory organization. And I think it's uh, predicated on this. Spectre, of course, is just a spirit or, in my way of thinking, a, a demon. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so keeping in mind this was written in 2016 20, and updated in 2017. This year, 2017, marks the 100-year anniversary of the time that Marx's Spectre possessed the Bolsheviks to bring bloody revolution to, Re to Russia. That same spirit proceeded to haunt most of Asia, much of Africa, and some of the Americas. Revolutionary Marxism still holds the record for having deceived, enslaved, terrorized, imprisoned, tortured, and murdered more millions of people than any other ideology in human history. The Leninist and Maoist interpreters of Karl Marx sacrificed over 160 million civilians on the altar of global equality. And that's the conservative estimate. But the Marxist attempts to create their vision of heaven on a godless earth produced such unsustainable conditions that every large experiment in Marxism collapsed towards the end of the 20th century. Contrary to the popular assumption, however, Marx's specter was never truly exorcised from the world. Borrowing from one of Jesus' analogies, if it departed at all, it did so only to return soon after to its old haunts with seven other spirits like it. And this is uh, from Matthew 12. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, uh, skipping a bit, it, it, uh, it goes and it brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. They enter and dwell there. And so the last state of that person is worse than the first. So it shall be with this generation. Of course, uh, Jesus is talking about that generation of Judeans who uh, rejected his uh, messiahship. I want to talk a little bit about what I, I will call Eastern Marxism. Most people will not refer to it in that way. Uh, and <clears throat> the main thing I want to communicate here is it's not gradualistic. It's a uh, sudden overthrow, sudden instant slavery. <clears throat> there's a few types. Uh, there's the Leninist interpretation of Marxism. I'll also throw in Trotskyites. They're not the exact same, but the, uh, it, if we paint with broad brush strokes, sure, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, the Stalinist, there's a difference there. It's a little more nationalistic, a little more almost uh, Napoleonistic, if you will. There's the Maoist implementation in China, and of course, uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia. So those are the Easterns. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about them. <clears throat> it's true that the hardline forms of Marxism in the East proved to be abject failures. They failed economically and morally. Throughout the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping made reforms in China that allowed it to become the economic giant that it is today. He encouraged the practices that were anathema to Marx, Lenin, and Mao, such as foreign investment, global market capitalism, and private competition. When he said, it doesn't matter if the cat is white or black, so long as it catches the mouse, he was implying that China would embrace more capitalistic-style freedoms, if doing so would end the starvation and deprivation fostered by the Marx-inspired policies of his predecessor, Chairman Mao. In other words, uh, technically speaking, China is not communist. They are uh, officially, they are in name. But uh, one of the, the apologists of Marxism will say, oh, well, that wasn't true Marxism. Uh, and I would say that every time anyone approaches true Marxism, the people starve and they give up on it and they have to infuse a little capitalism. 
As soon as, it was, as soon as it was clear that Gorbachev was not going to enforce the terrible Brezhnev doctrine, Poland, Hungary, and Romania sloughed off their miserable Marxist yokes without hesitation. And they set up free elections in uh, 1989. Between 1990 and 91, a dozen other Eastern European countries did the same. The Germans tore down the nasty Berlin Wall. In 1992, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics dissolved, and Russia turned away from their Marxist-Leninist communism. All of the big experiments in socio-politico-economic Marxism had failed. The smaller experiments in Marxism also failed. Every single one of the kibbutzim in Israel, uh, which were the smaller experiments, uh, became at least partially privatized in 2012. Now that we can look back at a century of empirical testing among many people groups and many nations, it's clear that Marx-inspired systems never ultimately delivered on their promises of equality, justice, and better conditions for the people. When prosperity did occasionally flow to some, it was either at the expense of thousands, sometimes millions, of others, or it was when Marxist constrictions were relaxed. Lenin himself was forced by circumstances to return Russia to a limited form of capitalism in 1922. He also had to accept several tons of wheat, given as a gracious gift by the United States, to prevent mass starvation in Russia. So Lenin tightened and then loosened the economic tourniquet as needed. Stalin tightened it, Khrushchev loosened it, Brezhnev tightened it, Gorbachev loosened it, and then it essentially untied itself. The Marxist penchant for moral bankruptcy was even more terrible than their penchant for economic bankruptcy. They proved more oppressive to the people than the yokes of oppression that they had supposedly liberated those people from. The toll in bloodshed finds no close parallels in all of human history. The number of victims murdered and purposely starved in the Soviet Union by Marxist-Leninist leaders is estimated to be over 60 million. They killed 10 million Ukrainians in the year 1933 alone. The Marxist victim tally in Mao's China is over 80 million people. Cambodian Marxists sacrificed 10 million victims on the altar of utopia. Marxism in Vietnam, North Korea, and Yugoslavia has put over 4 million people to death. <clears throat> now, these figures do not include the hundreds of thousands put to death in other countries that had the misfortune of becoming victims to hardline Marxist revolutions. <clears throat> I, I'm skipping a bit. <clears throat> it's, dif it's difficult to find other disasters and atrocities in human history that compare with the slaughters perpetrated by Marx's interpreters. The uh, bubonic plague that swept through Asia, Europe, and Africa in the 14th century, for example, ended the lives of an estimated 50 million humans. Genghis Khan and his soldiers slaughtered an estimated 40 million people during the expansion of the Mongol Empire in the 12th century. Four centuries of ugly European colonialism cost the world an estimated 50 million lives. World War I killed 9 million, wounded 23 million. World War II killed 25 million soldiers and 35 million civilians. So as tragic as each of these empire expansions, wars, and plagues were, they, were, they still somehow pale in comparison to the billion or so lives that were ended in connection with the specters unleashed by, Marsh, by Marx. Mm -hmm. The implementation of Marx's ideas and spirit has killed more people than the bubonic plague, the imperialism of Genghis Khan, European colonialism, and both world wars combined. So in hindsight, Marx was a, a misguided messiah, a perjured prophet, an inhumane humanist, a pseudoscientist, a revolutionary religionist, and a saboteur, not a savior. Not surprisingly, then, there are few leaders, intellectuals, and academics today who openly admit to being disciples of Marx. I mean, there are a few, but a lot of them won't admit to it. 
The university professors who are intoxicated by Marx's vision, who repackage Marx for their students, admit that Marx must have been wrong on at least one point. <clears throat> they may even argue that Lenin, Mao, Stalin, etc. were not faithful interpreters and consistent implement implementers of true Marxism. So when we define Marxism as a rigid economic theory that only applies to the long gone age of the Industrial Revolution, it could be safe to say that it's true in a very technical sense that Marxism is dead and that there are no real Marxists today. But when we consider Marxism as a family of other isms that were inspired by and heavily influenced by Marx's writings, Marxism arguably remains the most dominant clan of philosophies at work in the world today. <clears throat> Skipping a bit. So, uh, now I'm going to switch over to what I'll call the Western forms, or the gradualist forms of Marxism. And uh, these are most of the specters that I will mention. I'll hit each one of these one at a time. <clears throat> Marx was the sort of impatient fellow who much preferred the idea of a bloody revolution to bloodless reforms. But when faced with the challenge of the freedom-loving nations in the industrialized West, Marx and Engels made provision for a gradual strategy of reforms that would lead to revolution. Quote, the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class. Of course, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of property. Klaus Schwab saying, you will own nothing and you will be happy recently. And on the conditions of the bourgeois production, these measures will, of course, be different in different countries. In other words, it's not a one-size-fits-all sort of thing. He knows it's going to have to be different in Germany. The revolution will be done differently in Germany, the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, the industrialized nations. Nevertheless, in the most advanced countries, the following will be pretty generally acceptable, and he lays out the terms. So they realized that the despotic measures of revolution that would be effective later in the war-torn, pre-industrialized countries such as Russia, China, Korea, Vietnam, Angola, Afghanistan, etc., would not be likely to work out as well as they would in the most advanced countries, the countries that had already industrialized and were enjoying the prosperity that came from it. Professor Ebenstein suggested that Marx, quote, occasionally referred to England and the United States as two possible exceptions to the principle of social change through communist revolution, uh, revolution and dictatorship. So here it becomes helpful to divide Marxism roughly into Eastern and Western implementations. For the advanced countries in the West, Marx and Engels recommended ten planks for revolutionaries to use as waypoints in a gra gradual revolution. These steps include the abolition of property, a heavy income tax, the abolition of the right of inheritance, the death tax. That started with Marx. <clears throat> Confiscation of the property, centralization of credit, and a centralized bank. That's a huge one. And expect to see that in the headlines very soon with uh, centralized uh, bank digital currencies. Uh, also, centralization of the means of communication. Think of big tech and government colluding. That's already happening. Uh, and transport. Hmm. Factories. Uh, skipping a bit. And then free education, or we might say indoctrination for all children in public schools. Those are the ten planks for gradual revolution. All right, now I want to talk just a little bit about Karl Kotsky. The first gradualist approach to Marxism was developed by Karl Kotsky. Kotsky met personally with Marx and Engels more than once. He was one of their most ardent followers. On some matters, he diverged from them and became the leading theoretician of what would be called evolutionary democratic socialism. Lenin lambasted Kotsky for his rejection of some of Marxism's nastier features, such as impatient and bloody revolution, unwillingness to compromise, and the dictator of the uh, industrial working class. 
Trotsky's socialism has since influenced or even dominated the policy of the majority of nations around the world. Um, whereas the countries that became venom, uh, victims of Leninist and Maoist interpretations of Marxism have been hobbling away from Marxism, the nations of Western Europe, North America, South America, Australia, etc., uh, have become increasingly influenced by Marxism through this third way that synthesizes elements of capitalism, socialism, freedom, and social controls together. So this was an actual headline not too many years ago in News, Newsweek. I would say that Kotsky has a lot to do with that. Um, and, and it's not an either-or situation. It's not capitalist or communist or socialist. It's a, it's a mixture of all of that, throw in Keynesianism. It, it's, it's just a, a ratio, different ratios in different places is how I would say it. All right, Fabian Society. You can see this. This is hard to see. This actual stained glass window in uh, one of their the Fabian uh, buildings in Great Britain. You can see there's a a, sh a a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing. That was their choice. I think uh, that might be George Bernard Shaw. This might be Sidney Webb. Uh, you know, mainstays of what I was reading in public schools back in the seventies. Um, so the Fabian Society. Soon after Marx died, another Western interpretation of Marxism began to flourish in England and in New England. The Fabian Society named themselves after Fabius Maximus, a Roman general whom military historians recognize as the father of guerrilla warfare. In the Second Punic War, General Fabius prudently refused to send his soldiers to meet Hannibal's superior forces on the open battlefield in direct combat. Instead, he practiced a patient and cautious strategy of hit-and-run warfare, ambushes, constant harassment, and ultimately a war of attrition. Inspired by this form of warfare, the motto of the Fabian Socialists were, For the right moment you must wait, as Fabius did patiently, when warring against Hannibal. Though many censured his delays, when the right moment comes, you must strike hard, as Fabius did, or your waiting will be in vain and fruitless. The historian Plutarch wrote that Fabius's tactics were slow, silent, and yet relentless in their steady pressure. Hannibal's strength was gradually and imperceptibly undermined and drained away. Although the Fabian Marxists remained revolutionaries in the spirit of Marx, they differed from Marx on at least three important points. First, they differed on the matter of by whom and to whom. Whereas Marx forecasted that the proletariat, which is roughly the factory workers, would and should be the class to lead the revolt, the Fabians realized that revolution would only have a chance of success when led by a highly educated class of people. George Bernard Shaw, one of the better-known Fabians, wrote, Marxist Capital is not a treatise on socialism. It's a gerrymand against the bourgeoisie. It was supposed to be written for the working class. But the working man respects the bourgeoisie and wants to be bourgeoisie. Marx, Marx never got a hold of him for a moment. It was the revolting sons of the bourgeoisie itself, like myself, that painted the flag red. The middle and upper classes are the revolutionary element in society. The proletariat is the conservative element. So Shaw makes an interesting point. Neither Marx nor Engels were products of the working class. Marx was actually the son of a lawyer. Engels' father owned considerable amounts of property. Lenin came from a wealthy family. The working class rarely produces the intellectuals and the poets whose pens are mighty enough to inflame hearts and unsheath swords. Shaw was also prescient here. It would be the young and gullible students, boys and girls who had never had to work with their own hands to feed their families, who would be the most susceptible to believing revolu revolutionary propaganda. <coughs> I'm going to skip that chapter. Uh, the Fabians would uh, instead focus on university professors and students rather than factory workers. 
They would indoctrinate their agents of change through schooling and scholarship. In the words of one of its founders, the Fabian Society was, quote, founded in 1884 as an educational and propagandist center. It furnishes lectures in considerable numbers to all meetings where socialism in any guise whatsoever can possibly be introduced. As of 1885, their motto was, educate, agitate, organize. That's educate, agitate, organize. Sound, sound familiar today? Uh, by starting with an intellectual revolution in the minds of academics, the revolution would naturally bleed over to all other arenas of public policy and public opinion. Unable at first to uh, infiltrate the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, the Fabians established the London School of Economics. They started that. They would also create the Labour Party in the United Kingdom. They would publish journals, establish beachheads in several influential American universities. Meanwhile, some of their foremost members would also continue to spread propaganda in favor of the Eastern or Marxist-Leninist uh, state throughout the 1930s. All right, I'm skipping the section on humanism and I'm going on to Antonio Gramsci. By perceiving one of its greatest obstacles to adoption and devising strategies to overcome it, Antonio Gramsci may be the greatest interpreter of Karl Marx. A member of the Italian Socialist Party in 1913, founder of the Italian Communist Party in 1921, Gramsci fled to Lenin's Soviet Socialist Republic, to Russia, under threat of the rise of Italian fascism. But experiencing life in Russia made it obvious to him that the revolution that Marx had predicted still hadn't occurred, certainly not naturally. It was forced to occur. Life there in Russia also made it clear to him that the workers' paradise was maintained by propaganda, by lies, by secret police, and by fear. Whenever, uh, while he never became disillusioned with Marx's vision for revolution, of the workers, followed by the rise of a utopia from its ashes, uh, he still be he did become disillusioned with all the artificial attempts to create the revolution in Russia, China, and elsewhere. Uh, now, afraid, but then while he's in Stalin's Russia, afraid of the insanity and cruelty that Stalin had a reputation for, Gramsci returned to Italy to take his chances among the less frightening fascists. During nine years in an Italian prison, he managed to cobble together nine volumes of writings that could help achieve a Marxist world. The Roman Catholic historian Malachi Martin summarizes, this is going to be a long quote, but I think it will not be a waste of time. He says, Gramsci, intellectually a product of the Roman Catholic Society of Italy, was far more advanced than either Marx or Hegel in his understanding of Christian metaphysics in general, or Thomism in particular, and of just the richness of the Roman Catholic heritage. What was essential, insisted Gramsci, was to Marxize the inner man. Only when that was done could you successfully dangle the utopia of the worker's paradise before his eyes. To be accepted in a peacefully and humanely agreeable manner, without revolution or violence or bloodshed, you, you make them want it. What Marx and Lenin had got wrong, Gramsci said, was the part about the immediate proletarian revolution. Now, his Italian socialist brothers could see as well, just as he did, that in a country such as Italy, or Spain, or France, Belgium, Austria, Latin America for that matter, the national tradition of all the classes was virtually consubstantial with Roman Catholicism. The idea of a proletarian revolution in such a climate was impractical at best, and could be counterproductive at worst. Gramsci had a better way, a subtler blueprint for Marxist victory. Use Lenin's geopolitical structure not to conquer streets and cities, argued Gramsci. Use it to conquer the mind of civil society. Use it to acquire a Marxist hegemony over the minds of the populations that must be won. They must join in whatever liberating causes might come to the fore. Marxists must join with women. 
with the poor, with those who find certain civil laws oppressive. They must enter into every civil, cultural, and political activity in every nation, patiently, patiently leavening them like yeast in a loaf of bread. Uh, if there was any true superstructure that had to be eliminated, it was the Christianity that had created and still pervaded Western culture in all of its forms, activities, and expressions. Marxist ac action must be unitary against what he saw as the failing remnant of Christianity. By a unitary attack, Gramsci meant that Marxists must change the residually Christian mind. He needed to alter that mind, to turn it into its opposite in all details. So, not that it would just merely become a non-Christian mind, but that it would become an anti-Christian mind. Other Marxists were saying similar things. Christian Rakowski, a leader in Trotsky's blend of global Marxism, for example, reportedly said, Communism cannot be the victor if it will have suppressed the still living Christianity. In reality, Christianity is our only enemy, our only real enemy, since all the political and economic phenomena, phenomena, ah, sorry, phenomena in the bourgeois states are only its consequences. Christianity, controlling the individual, is capable of annulling the revolutionary projection of the natural Soviet or atheistic state by choking it. And as we see in Russia, things have reached a point of the creation of that spiritual nihilism which is dominant in the ruling masses, which have nevertheless remained Christian. This obstacle has not yet been removed during 20 years of Marxism in Russia. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church was not totally co-opted or not totally conquered. All right, so this is uh, Herbert Marcuse, who was uh, mentioned last night. Uh, he's one of the, the better-known members of the Frankfurt School. Um, let's talk about, well, we'll mainly focus on him. <clears throat> Before I do, though, let me show you this. So here's just uh, one uh, of the pictures of Seattle. Uh, the, 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 uh, the Seattle Police Department turned into the People Department. Mm -hmm. um, as you may recall, not too terribly long ago, uh, during the lockdowns, uh, there was a, uh, a liberated zone in Seattle called, mm -hmm. that we called Chaz or Chop. Um, this, this goes back to, well to some degree, to Mao himself, but uh, also let's, let's, uh, let's just say uh, Herbert Marcuse's uh, many ideas are, are still alive and well today. All right, in the 1930s, a group of professors at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Frankfurt in Germany, or the Frankfurt School for short, developed their own unique strands of Western Marxism. While they preferred to call their theory the critical theory of society, their work has more commonly been, uh, become known as cultural Marxism. They were keenly aware of the fact that the German workers did not revolt as Marx had predicted. And that's why I called Marx a failed prophet. He, he expected, based on his scientific laws, that's what would happen. The industrialized German workforce would revolt first. Didn't happen. But the fact that Marxism had failed in its first and biggest test wasn't enough to make them abandon Marx. <sighs> they remained Marxist at the core, and they sought to salvage Marx's vision for the dissolution of that evil capitalist systems that dominated Europe and the United States and plagued the world. Max Horkheimer defined their critical theory of society as one, a theory dominated at every turn by a concern for reasonable conditions of life, in other words, you know, be dissatisfied with the way things are, to a theory which condemns existing social institutions and practices as inhuman, criticized them, and three, a theory which contemplates the need for alteration of society as a whole, think totalitarian, authoritarian revolution. Now, in harmony with Marx, the Frankfurt School theorist taught that everything in Western society is so evil that every facet of it needs to be ruthlessly criticized. There's that word again, criticism. 
uh, criticized, weakened, and destroyed. The rise of Nazi movement in Germany forced these professors uh, to flee their German homeland. The nationalist socialists were com competing with the Marxist socialists, who were more international, and, uh, and the Frankfurt theorists were definitely recognizable as the international variety of Marxists. They were also all Jewish. So in 1935, they fled Germany and they made Columbia University of New York their new base of operations. They did not flee to Stalin's Moscow because they were critical of Stalin's dystopian implementation of Marx. So instead, they enjoyed their safety, liberty, opportunities, wealth, and honor and prestige as university professors in the United States after World War II. Uh, after World War II ended, some of the Frankfurt pers uh, professors did return to Germany, others stayed to indoctrinate university students with their ideas about cultural revolution and criticism. The United States had emerged from World War II as the most powerful nation in history. In taking Germany's place as the most powerful nation, they, the United States, inherited the ire of those whose target was to harass the powerful. In other words, in the critical theorist minds, the USA after World War II had become the new Nazi Germany. All meanwhile, enjoying all the benefits of living here. <clears throat> Although sympathetic to Marx's war on inequality among socioeconomic classes, these cultural Marxists instead focused on other cultural areas where people groups encounter in inequality. They saw power inequalities in the clash of cultures, particularly where traditional Western culture dominated non-Western cultures, of races, where European races having dominated non-European races, of religions where people practicing various forms of Christianity have subj subjugated and oppressed other peoples and other religions, of family where parents dominate their children and adults oppress the youth, of gender, well, because men often dominate women, and sexual orientation, where heterosexual, heterosexual communities oppress people in LGBTQ categories. Why didn't the Euro, sorry, why didn't the workers of Europe unite and revolt as Marx had predicted? That was one of the main problems these neo-Marxist theorists were also trying to solve. Perhaps Marx had been right about most everything, but had underestimated the grip that the European cultural heritage, chiefly from the Greeks, the Romans, the Celtics, the Celts, the Germans, the Roman Catholic, and also the Protestant Reformation influences, had on the hearts and minds. But if these cultural barriers to Marxism could be eroded away, the revolution could proceed. <clears throat> The chief weapon in their ideological arsenal was criticism. The Frankfurt School made it academically fashionable to subject every old truth claim to new criticism, or critical theory. Quite in harmony with Marx, every established authority, every established belief must be questioned, challenged, critiqued, doubted, ridiculed, marginalized, weakened, subverted, destroyed, and replaced. Marx would have appreciated that. Uh, definitely Lenin was known for that as well. Beginning with criticism, Marx's specter can proceed to liberate all the peoples of the world from the oppression of classical civilization and of Judeo-Christian culture. That's where the liberation needs to happen. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they say that. <clears throat> Thirty-seven. All right, I'm going to skip a bit. I'm going to go to Saul Alinsky. <laughs> right. Western Marxists sometimes lost patience with the slow pace of progress. During the 1960s, several revolutionaries in the New Left movement began to drift away from the gradual strains of Marxism and towards the more overtly, i.e. Maoist, forms of uh, end of the Marxist spectrum. Some leftist radicals began calling for armed conflict with police in the city streets to create liberated zones. Does that sound familiar? 
Others organized riots. Some even called for students to kill their parents. Now, Saul Alinsky challenged this drift. Alinsky was an effective workers' union organizer, a talented community organizer, a radical political leftist, a communist sympathizer, and a Marx-inspired revolutionary. Now, he helped turn the tide of the new left away from the violent approach and back to a more gradualist and more subtle approach. It was not their ends that he disapproved of, of the Marxists. He, too, fantasized about the destruction and the overthrow of the United States of America, but it was rather their means that he criticized. Quote, they, the new left radicals, also urge violence and cry, burn the system down. They have no illusions about the system, but plenty of illusions about the way to change our world. It is to this point that I have written this book. The original title, by the way, was uh, Rules for Revolutionaries. I think the publisher said, yeah, let's, let's not use the word revolutionaries. Let's just change it to radicals. Make it a... Uh... Yeah. So here's a quote from Alinsky that I think is, uh, boils it down very well. He says, uh, what follows is, and he's talking about this book, what follows is for those who want to change the world from what it is to what they believe it should be. The Prince was written by Machiavelli for the haves on how to hold power. Rules for Radicals is written for the have-nots on how to take it away. All right, I've got five minutes left. Um, I, I always hate to leave a problem uh, and not give a solution. Now, there is more in the paper that, that touches on possible solutions. Um, I'm going to, uh, I can't, I can't miss this. So this is Klaus Schwab who was mentioned recently. This is a, a bus. You know who that guy is? That's Lenin. Yes. Yeah. And, and this is going on today. Go to their website, you know, World Economic Forum, go to the Great Reset. Great Reset is what we used to call, you know, the glorious communist revolution. It's just changed names. It sounds, sounds better. I think, um, here's, here's my prediction. I think in, in the, uh, at least here in the Western world, when we uh, look back to the halcyon days of old and talk about how the revolution happened, we'll probably say something like this. Well, it happened very gradually, and then all of a sudden, suddenly. Now, uh, I want to end on a, on a good tone. This I just learned recently. This is called the Acro Corinth. You can, you can barely see there's a... Uh, there's, there's walls, there's bastions, there's a fortress on this Acro Corinth. This is uh, 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 the city of Corinth lies in its shadow. And so this is a major fortress that all the Corinthians would have lived in the shadow of. With that in mind, I just want to look at this. This is a great verse for apologists. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians, explaining the ministry of the Apostle Paul and his co-workers. Uh, who, who were not actually apostles. They were just joining him in his apostolic ministry. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds, such as the Acro Corinth. We destroy arguments, and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God take every thought captive to Christ. So I, I want to encourage us. Let's uh, let's seek divine power when we try to understand our enemies, um, the enemies of the faith. Understand their 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 uh, insights. Also, I, I want you, as a scholarly audience, I want I wanted to show these pictures of these guys uh, because look, he's got books. All of these guys are writers. You know, the the pen is mightier than the sword because it's the pen that ultimately. Uh, gives voice to the words that then unsheath the swords. Um, we all know ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have victims. So next time you are writing something at your keyboard, typing, think about these guys and the effect they've had on the world. They've changed our world. And uh, we, we may be on the, on the cusp of feeling the Great Reset uh, and, and greater pain very soon. And uh, so when you're at your keyboard, you may be doing something that's very important. 
uh, and I will leave it at that. Thanks for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>